Hey friends, it's Melvin. Thanks for tuning into this episode. Here's just a few quick things I wanted to notify you guys about before we get started. First up, very soon, new episodes will be releasing Wednesday mornings rather than Tuesday. So don't panic if you don't see a new episode on Tuesday. Just wait a little longer and you'll see it in your feed. Second, we've introduced a mailbag. Check those show notes and toward the bottom you'll see a mailbag link. You'll then be able to text us any questions you might have about movies, the movie industry, or any movie slash Christian related questions you might have. Then we'll respond in a future episode, so send us your questions now. Up next, Patreon polls, which are available to Patreon supporters at the $3 tier or higher, have been updated. Supporters can now suggest films or shows to be reviewed at the end of each month. The two most liked submissions will become the options for the Patreon poll, so if you want to hear us talk about your favorite movie or show, join our Patreon and start campaigning. And lastly, whether you're a new or long-time listener, please consider writing a review or rating the Cinematic Doctrine podcast on iTunes and Spotify. Apart from financially supporting on Patreon, these are the two most helpful ways to support the show. And that's it. Enjoy the episode. You're listening to Cinematic Doctrine. Dan texted me this week and said, hey, do you want to just, like, record for Donda instead? And I was like, that's two and a, that's like a two-hour album, man. I don't know if I'll listen to that in time. But It's I shorter say, than this movie. <laughs> it's not shorter than this movie. Is it really? Yeah. Oh. By, like, two minutes. Granted, if you count the credits, because the official runtime in this movie is like an hour 50 or something. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I figured, I mean, I didn't listen to Donda yet, but, of course, I don't know if you've listened to... Call me if you get lost. Yet, have you? I've heard songs from. I've not sat down from and listened it? to the whole album. No, it's a good. It's a good album. The more I listen to it, the more I like it. But I figured if you wanted to talk about Donda, because now Kanye's Christian, maybe I don't know. We're still figuring that one out, especially after. Well, the last, not especially after that, last two years, as as though to imply that I can decide who's Christian and not. But like, poor guys, poor guys going through it. But did you want to share thoughts on Donda before we get started? So I've listened to the whole album four or five times now. And then, Jeez, you... <laughs> when, when, when a Moonshade Pool came out, the re- latest Radiohead album, I listened to it like nine times in a day. So I guess I shouldn't laugh. But I mean, to be fair, like <laughs> on subsequent listens, I would just I would occasionally skip some of the tracks because they're like a minute and a half and they don't have anything to do with the rest of the album. What's really fascinating about it is it's a perfect musical reflection of the creator who made it which is it is a complete mess where there's two albums essentially there is a great 12 to 13 track christian rap record mixed in with a just bizarre unfocused unfinished something else that's just on the album uh nothing exemplifies more than the fact the album is 27 tracks if i remember correctly but the last like four or five are just alternate versions of other songs in the other album because I don't think he could decide which versions he wanted to to release, which is m- given more cl- uh, credence as a possible theory. Theory because he later stated that he did not give clearance for the album to be released. <laughs> that his record label just released the album without him wanting to release it. So who knows? You might be getting a, a fifth version of this album. But I was like very excited for it. I kind of kept up with all the different listening parties that took place which were all bizarre in their own right where every listening party he showed off different versions of these songs essentially weird guests would show up famously da baby and marilyn manson were at one of the listening parties yikes uh, the last one <laughs> had a complete recreation of his childhood home in the middle of a stadium so they all would just take turns listening to the record on the porch and so <laughs> on Fort marilyn manson da baby are just sitting on his porch and then famously, I don't. Do you watch video game Dunky? Yeah, yeah. He's one of my wife, one of my wife and I's favorite YouTubers. So he did Dunky did a live stream where he quote unquote streamed Donda, and <laughs> it was it was just a complete farce. But like one of the joke tracks on Donda was this like meme from 2018, where it's like the Gluba Globa guy. Mm-hmm. Do you remember that song? Maybe, I don't know. Yeah, it's just like... Maybe I missed it. It's this like sample from a children's movie where a guy's like, I'm the glubba 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 glubba. And then, so, for like a minute and a half, Donkey was like, oh yeah, this is great. Oh man, I can't believe it. You know? <laughs> and then afterwards, he was just like, man, I, I gotta tell you guys, Donda, this is a ge- this is genius. 
And so one of the songs, uh, Remote Control, the first two times Kanye played it live, it was a pretty good song. <laughs> then on the third live plague, where this is supposed to be like a guest verse, it just starts going like with the beat. It just, you just start hearing, I'm the glubba 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 glubba. And he just, for, <laughs> for some reason, he included that in the song. And so you just see Kanye, who's been wearing a complete like black face mask that covers his entire head. He just like vibed on his porch to the glubba glubba thing. And everyone's like, what is happening? What is this? Like, what? <laughs> and Dunkey just tweets, like, I told you guys I had the dawn to drive. You guys didn't believe me. <laughs> and so leading up to the album's release, everyone's like, which version of this? Is this just going to be the Globa Globa thing? And so on remote control plays, and it's pretty good. And then the last, like, 30 seconds, you just faintly hear, like, like turn down a little bit while the beat's playing. I'm the Globa 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 Globa. <laughs> it's just like, why are you including <laughs> on the actual record? What is wrong with this guy? And that's the whole album. It's just there's all these great songs punctuated by some really strange creative decisions. None is stranger than the fact that Kanye definitely still Christian. He's definitely he's still rapping about Jesus and all this stuff. And there's two problems, though. First is like when Kanye raps about his struggles, his problems and struggles are so beyond anything that we could ever understand that's tough to relate. Right. So he's rapping about whether well, I should have bought some Burberry clothing, which for those who don't know, Burberry is like one of the most expensive clothing brands in the world. That's why I charge the prices that I charge. <laughs> I know. I love yeah. that. And this like it's <laughs> and it's always in the middle of these really great songs. Like he yeah. even on that song, like he's that song, the one you're referencing on God, like he's yeah. given glory to God for all these things God's done in his life. And then the, then he takes a strange turn. He where brings he, it down. Where yeah. he for twenty whole seconds he raps about why his ticket prices are infamously more expensive than more. Else. and his it's, t-shirts that are just like a white t-shirt which are with a line on it. It's like a hundred dollars. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so the album is punctuated with things like that. The other thing is none of the other guest rappers got the memo this is a Christian record. So they are all swearing and saying the N-word like like they usually would. But Despite the fact Donda has infamously been delayed, remade, re-recorded, redone. He's got time to add memes and replace people's guest verses. He just censors them. So some of these Doesn't guys... Doesn't literally just like beep or whatever? No, or what it, it's just the drop thing. This is just like a moment of oh, silence. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so there's yeah. guys like rapping about like the same thing everyone else raps about. And a lot of them, they're trying to put like a religious slant on it. Like a guy would be like, yeah, I'm going through trials and tribulations. And like, like my, like, you know, and they'll talk about people getting shot in the streets or whatever. And Connie just censors them. It's the weirdest thing. Like, why couldn't you just make them re record their verses or not include them? Or not include them. Yeah. It's so, but like, I get it. A lot of these guest verses are great. Jay Electronica has probably the best verse in the whole album on what I think is possibly Connie's magnum opus, which is a song called Jesus Lord, which is eight and a half minutes. And it's, great it's one of the best songs he's ever made where the chorus which serves as like the background for the rest of the song is like you know it's a guy like leading a worship thing like tell me if you know anyone who needs jesus and so and then kanye cuts like one of his best verses he's done in a long time which is rapping about like not just himself which when it, when, it, when he leaves when he moves away from himself everything gets a lot better where he raps about like just a general character you know, someone growing up in the streets of the projects who's going through all this difficulty who, you know, this or and then he wraps our girl who gets pregnant and her 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 husband leaves her. And now she's like a teen mother. And in the background, you just hear like so, like the name Jesus being repeated. And it's like really powerful. And Jay Electronic is a great verse. And then like the last two minutes is like he just includes a whole answering machine message for somebody who's like thanking Connie for helping him out because his dad was incarcerated when he was a kid. And now he has his own kids and he's like my grandkids have never met their grandfather and they've never like been able to even like touch each other and so it's like when the so the 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 repeated motive of like do you know somebody who needs jesus it's he's bringing it back like we're like all these different people need jesus in their life and it's moments like that where you go this is what the album could have been but then there's these bizarre songs where he, they i don't even know for sure what they're about and then like because you'll get one song where he's rapping about his marriage with kim falling apart and it's beautiful because like he's talking about how he needs God in this moment and how they've just grown apart. And apparently they're working on the relationship because uh, the last listening party with the Gleba Globa one ended with a Kanye and Kim had a fake wedding ceremony in the middle of this listening party, which is crazy. And then it ends with he's inside his childhood home and he gets lit on fire and his house burns down. So he gets lit on fire. <laughs> so Kanye is just on fire. Everyone's like, in a fan of three minutes, Kanye got remarried and got lit on fire. Like, this is insane. <laughs> and so moments like that, like where he's rapping about his 
relationship with Kim and like actually getting deep digging in his faith are great. But then it's just like this is whole other album where I have no idea what he's trying to say. I have no idea what it's about. So there's tons of songs that could be like a minute and a half cut like out of them, which not just global globa type stuff, but just like it's the whole album has a sense of like no idea was not done. Everything got kept in. Nobody's nobody's verses got cut. Nobody's alternate takes on the record got cut. This got added as bonus tracks. It's just it's an unfocused mess, but it's also kind of brilliant at times, which is just Kanye. It sounds like what Mac DeMarco does, except not distilled into what Mac DeMarco does, where Mac DeMarco will release an album and then to game the Spotify system, which is basically constantly release stuff because it constantly gets you plays because then it constantly gets you money. And I'm not implying that Mac DeMarco is a genius because when you listen to him, I mean, he's a smart guy, but it's not like he did this knowing ah, I'm going to game Spotify. He just went, people really like listening to my demos. So then he'll re- like, I think his last album, I can't remember what it's called. I think it's Here Comes the Cowboy. There's the album. And then there's Here Comes the Cowboy Demos 1. And then there's Here Comes the Cowboy Demos 2. And they're all separate albums. But it sounds like this album from Kanye Donda is like, uh, here's the demos, the B-sides, the leftovers, (laughs) the unfinished songs, and then the finished songs all together (laughs) put out for you to listen to. Praise God. (laughs) Like it sounds... But I figure if you get to the the financial stability that that Kanye gets to, and also if his contract is correct, like I think there's rumors that literally he legally can never stop making music. I mean, what's he got to lose <laughs> by just putting out that? But he's but he like he's an, not only is he a notorious perfectionist, he has whole records that he's made and recorded, just never released. In fact, one of the songs on here, Hurricane, was recorded for Yandi. And so it never dropped. You yeah. finally got around to releasing it here, which is a great song, except for Kanye's verse. It's the worst, but like the weekend is the weekend's part on. It, it's great. This album has a who's who of like guest features, uh, Jay-Z, Kid Cudi, Playboy Cardi, Jay Electronica, the baby, <laughs> young thud. JPEG mafia has been doing a lot of stuff. Is he on it? No, that'd be cool. He's though. been Peggy would have been a great addition here. He's been on a lot of people. But I love the idea of like youth pastors, like listening to Lil Dirk and, playboy cardi for the first time because they're on the new kanye record it's um i don't know like part of the album is some of the best stuff he's ever made part of it's just weird which is like ever since the normal my beautiful dark twisted fantasy he's released all these projects that are polarizing and you can hear like yeezus is some people think it's the best album they've ever heard some people think it's complete garbage life of pablo is literally unfinished and so and then jesus is king just blew the world away i think about jesus is king a lot as an as a thing that exists and then what's the one before jesus is king the one that was ghost written can't remember well he had um, a bunch of I'm um, polar it's great yeah or whatever well that was part of his whole thing released a bunch of these short like seven or eight track things he did that and kids see ghosts yeah yeah i heard kids see ghosts was huge and he also released a uh, new nas and uh push t uh record as well and i don't like there's Jesus King is such a genuine reflection of young faith. Like it's so genuine and you believe every word he says on it. And there's something really beautiful about how kind of rough around the edges it is. Yeah, it's sweet. It's great. I love it. And um, anytime people talk about like, what about people who don't know that, who the Lord is? What about people who've never heard the gospel? And I was like, I was thinking about how the fact that like when Kanye dropped that album, the words Jesus King or put right in the middle of Times Square. Yeah. I, I was in the Reform Pub, and people who have no idea who Kanye is were just like, I'm in New York. What is this? And they're posting pictures of, like, just Jesus yeah. King. And there are yeah, people yeah. who legitimately wondering if the end times is happening or something. They're like, is this it? Is this the it's end? Like, no, Kanye just has a new album. No. There's a new 30, <laughs> there's a new 30 minutes of Yay <laughs> on Spotify. Yeah, nice. <laughs> and it's just like, man, I when, when the Bible talks about, like, you know, the stones will cry out. Or, like, we remember, think about how the Bible talks about how, like, he, used to, he spoke through a goat. It's like, man, if, like, if if all these pastors in the in the world where, like, you get people, like, Carl Lentz and all these people are wishy washy on the gospel, or they they go on talk shows and they get asked hard questions about abortion and gay marriage. They can't give the right answers. God's just like, all right, I'm Gotta using Kanye because <laughs> man, he he like. <laughs> Well, it's uh, to reference a couple episodes ago when you were complaining about how on Twitter you followed a bunch of pastors and all they do is complain about mass and stuff. And then you have like Kanye and like, yeah, it's a mess. His Twitter. He's a but crazy every now person, and then, but yeah, yeah. <laughs> every now and then it's like 
whoa, that's some sick theology, bro. <laughs> nice job. Well, he was going. He was going on. He was doing podcasts and stuff, and he was just talking about like. First off, he was like, "Abortion's murder. It's genocide of black people." And it's like, well, Carl Lentz wouldn't say it, so I guess I guess Kanye's got to say it of all the yeah. trustworthy people. But then he's going. He's talking about you know. He's talking about getting saved, and he's being very blunt about like you need to get saved, you need to follow Jesus, and it's like that's all you need to say. And so, I mean. Maybe we wouldn't need a Kanye West to fall if, if everyone else was just man enough to get up and speak the gospel. But praise God for for picking him. Yeah, <laughs> and I, nice. I hope he's doing okay because he sounds not okay based on his album. Yeah, he sat like he sounds like he's out of his mind, and he's always been out of his mind. It's the it's part of what makes being a Kanye West fan interesting is you literally never know what he's going to do, which is kind of right. interesting. Where like when Jesus King dropped, I was on the Kanye West subreddit, and half the people in that sub were about ready to like you know, commit suicide because they're just like, what is this? This is horrible. Why is he talking about Jesus so much? Like, and everyone's yeah. like, I, I really like the record except for all the Jesus stuff he's saying, which is all the record. And then now everyone else is just like morbidly curious, like what's he going to do next? What's Connie's going to do next? And so it's a weird way to get an audience for the gospel, but they've all heard it now. But I guess we should get into, I can only imagine. Speaking of Christian music. Christian music. Yeah. Dan, uh, I think you've probably had a, a stronger you, you were more planted in an evangelical culture than i was so i think you probably grew up with bands like mercy me and amy grant and artists like that so like why don't you go ahead and introduce the uh thing because i there there's a scene in this where it's sort of played up as the cameo scene and they're like oh, it's amy grant it's so and so whatever and i'm like who is that? <laughs> uh, the fact you said it's so and so whatever it tells yeah. me everything you know. I'm like I, I think I've heard that name. I actually think I went to a Michael W. Smith concert, but I don't remember. Uh, man, the the not Michael W. Smith they got for this movie looks nothing like Michael W. Smith, and that really bothered me. I think I got a T-shirt at that concert. It was Burger King logo, but it said Jesus is King. You remember that when they were taking company logos and putting them in? Yeah, I love Kanye. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Hey there, it's your friendly neighborhood call to action. Just checking in on you. Hope you're doing all right. I'm just stopping by to say, you know, if you enjoy the show, you can always subscribe and write a review for Cinematic Doctrine. There's iTunes, Podchaser, basically anywhere you listen. You can give us a shout out with a thumbs up, five stars, gripping positivity. Or if you hate the show, you can say that too. Hey, what? What are you saying? Why are you saying that? Well, I'm not going to tell them what to do, Ted. They're free to do what they want. Our analytics say we got a lot of listeners in the U.S., and you know they love their freedoms. And you're also free to check out our Twitter. Very active there. We host polls, memes. There's also the Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group called Cinematic Doctrine Facebook group. If you want to join, just answer the questions, read the rules, and tell them the podcast sent you. Also, you should check out our website. Some really cool stuff there. Editorials, written reviews for movies we haven't had time to cover. Always check out cinematicdoctrine.com when you get the chance. Oh, uh, Ted also told me I shouldn't forget to mention the Patreon. Something about you can support us or something? Wait, Ted, I thought this was like a hobby thing. You want me to... expand Cinematic Doctrine. You know this Right, right, right. Yeah, I, (laughs) I forgot. I'm the one who put all this together. Yeah, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as low as $3 a month, you can gain access to exclusive content like The Pre-Show, which features free-form and Christian-friendly discussions on all kinds of topics, as well as influence the podcast. That's right, each month you get to vote on a movie we discuss on the show. Previous movies our lovely Patreon supporters have chosen are To All the Boys I've Loved Before, Hamilton, Onward, and American Gospel Christ Alone. Huh, you guys have good taste. Anyways, I gotta run, so I'll see you guys later. But yeah, what what's uh, I can only imagine about? Well, I can only imagine, as I'm sure everyone is aware, is a movie adaptation of the popular Christian song. I, I'm trying to think, like, so I can only imagine, actually, like, and anyone who was around at the time may remember that this song dropped during kind of like the waning years of CCM as being sort of a dominant uh, force in Christian music in the sense that... What year? Was it in like 97? So 2001 is kind okay. of where the album came out. And by that, I don't mean Christian music. Christian music was actually becoming more popular than ever. But the idea that Christian music 
as sort of a unified homogenous one thing where like ccm as a set genre in and of itself and right shortly after that you started seeing more branches where like pod was considered a christian band you artists like thousand foot crutch and skillet coming out where christian music became a more broader umbrella so to speak more genres yeah more genres uh, christian hip-hop and rap started becoming uh bigger at the time as well where whereas before then and so and this is something that my older christian people will 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 no doubt recognize there used to be like wow cds which is the christian version of now that's what i call music they, we christians had wow mm-hmm. and you get one and it, like the first track would be a dc talk song and the second track would just be a worship song and the third track would be you know like an amy grant song or a jennifer knapp song and it was just like this hodgepodge of genres that otherwise would never be mixed on a record but because christian music was seen as such a more insular community like one 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 of them had a song from veggie tales it's like one of the hit songs, the cheeseburger Whoa. song. <laughs> that would totally mess up the tone of the album. <laughs> so yeah, you have Jars of Clay, Third Day, <laughs> and you know Rebecca St. James. Did and... Creed ever end up on those albums? No. Creed was <laughs> Creed never did. POD got one Set Your Eyes to Zion, I think, ended up on one of the WoW CDs. But their music was seen as a little too mainstream. And, they, and so they never got anyway, I've gone too far off the beaten path. But I absolutely one hundred percent. I uh, grew up in this culture that they're talking about. Uh, growing up as a kid, I was not allowed to listen to non-Christian music. So the only CDs I had in the house and the only radio I ever heard was Christian uh, music. And so I grew up listening to like Drives of Clay to this day, still my favorite bands. But I listened to a lot of like Mercy Me, Casting Crowns, Third Day. I am not a huge fan of Mercy Me or Casting Crowns. I think they're both very boring. I do not like their music almost at all. I think I've always thought you could just if Mercy Me toured as Casting Crowns and Casting Crowns tours Mercy Me, I don't think anyone would notice a difference because they sound so much the same. Like you could throw them and Big Daddy Weave and you know all of these other artists that all have interchangeable names and sounds. Like you could play Plum, you could play any of these artists, and it just all sounds like the same kind of goop. That said, I always have a deep amount of respect for them because a lot of them perhaps turn down other record offers. And I've heard stories of these from various musicians who they were given chances to quote unquote sell out. And they kind of never did because for a lot of these artists, they felt like their calling wasn't just a career, but they did feel like this was their ministry. And funnily enough, a lot of the artists that I really did like ended up kind of going off the deep end in some way where Mm, people like Dustin Kendrew or Under Oath or MXPX and all these artists that like, I was like, no, those are the real artists. A lot of them kind of faltered later in life, for whatever reason. Weirdly, POD did. (laughs) They've pretty much been who they are the whole time. So yeah, because I remember even growing up, they were like, I remember liking POD a little bit. I didn't own any of them, but I remember there was like a, uh, it was like a, you know how like on TV, there used to be like music channels. It wasn't yes. MTV, but it was literally music channels. Yeah. And it was like a Christian one and POD would be on Flyleaf would be on stuff like that. Oh, I love Flyleaf. I remember my parents even mentioning, not warning me from listening to them, but mentioning that they had some baggage, <laughs> but ironically, my dad loved Creed. So I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I found that really interesting because Creed Scott has, Stapp is a mess. Yeah. No offense to him, but he's a mess, which I, Hey, if he knows the Lord, good. That's a yeah. great thing. Cause the Lord works with all kinds of people and that's a net right. positive because Creed also has some good music but i know that that's a controversial thing to say considering i think every critic on the planet's like creed is the worst but then like they're multi-platinum they're, they're pretty multi-gold. terrible but, uh, yeah. but i maintain <laughs> their their album covers rock dude it's like oh <laughs> man you ever clay. hear photoshop yeah. it's like it's awesome. that horrible tree <laughs> the weathering one yeah, yeah the tree with their faces on it i i mean most of the bands pretty so lo- some of these people might know this but uh Matt Tremonti and uh, I think Miles Kennedy was also for played with them, but like pretty much the entire band has a second band, not with Scott Stapp called Alter Bridge, which I consider to be far better because I think the issue most people have with Creed is Scott Stapp's voice and his very melodramatic lyricism. Yeah, that said, their album in two thousand nine isn't bad like that's on overcome you mean that that comeback one or whatever? Yeah, yeah. that's a pretty good, just like general like post grunge rock song. It's fine. Uh, Flyleaf is what it is incredible. I love Lacey, Lacey Stern. I, I, I think Lacey, yeah, Lacey Stern is a singer. She left the band and now does mostly just ministry and stuff. So I have a deep respect for them. But 
I know multiple people that saw Flyleaf live because they would tour with like Corn and Breaking Benjamin, and they would like they would end their sets with How He Loves, and they would give a whole gospel presentation. And my friends saw them get booed multiple times because <laughs> the audience to see Corn was not there to hear about Jesus. Yeah, well, they just had to wait till the lead singer right. of Corn got to know Jesus. I'm yeah. tell- so you know, Lacey, Lacey went on. She's like, "Yeah, we start praying for those guys." And if you look at the timeline, Five start praying for Corn not too long before Brian Welch uh, got saved. So hey, there's something to that. But anywho. I could talk about Christian music all day because this is I, I I did not listen to non-Christian music till I got to high school. It, but so I very much remember specifically this song coming out. Uh, for those who do not were not there when I can only imagine hit. It was a massive hit immediately. It was everywhere. It was on two different albums. I mercy me. There were multiple compilation records that came out, uh, which I don't know if you remember this at all, but the, you used to see tons of tv commercials for cds this is not a thing that exists now a lot of people have memories of like seeing like the same ad for the matchbox 20 box set <laughs> i'm playing on nickelodeon disney channel for some reason i remember the the, the now and the kids bop ones on nickelodeon stuff like kids that. bop and then you'd yeah. be like here's the top ballads of the 80s or here is like the rock songs of the whatever and i can only imagine was on like roughly 40 of these different compilation cds where like there was the one that was just literally just called i can only imagine and then dot 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 underneath it was like 16 great christian songs you know like where they would sell whole song uh whole albums just on the strength of this one song and specifically yeah. this song quickly joined butterfly kisses by bob carlisle as Butterfly Kisses is the official song of dads giving away their daughters at weddings. And I can only imagine very quickly became the song for funerals, where this song is played at 15 to 20 funerals I've been to. It gets played at non-Christian funerals. It gets played all over. My uh, One of my in-laws, her sister was a lesbian. And so like when she passed away in the hospital with you know her longtime partner there, they played, I can only imagine, on her like cell phone um there and like all these you know it's because the whole like community was there for it and she was like yeah all these gay women were there and they're all crying because there's something about this song where especially you do the subject matter and often the context of people hear it where those the most staunchest of atheist people who do not believe in any sort of afterlife in a moment of vulnerability because they're hitting with the weight of death hearing this song something about it just really affects and, and hits people deeply and specifically mm-hmm. for my family my strongest memory of this song is we were flying into texas to see my grandmother who is not doing well in the hospital we were told that she had maybe you know one or two weeks left to live so we flew out the next day and then the day we arrived we were going to see the see her at the hospital um we got the news that she passed away and so i woke up at like four in the morning to my dad listening on a portable cd player listening to this song and he was just crying in the hotel room so this is a song that every good christian youth group kid remembers but it's also one that Unlike a lot of Christian, I'll call it kitsch. There's a lot of Christian culture. We just talked about that corny T-shirt that you bought. Um, I've seen <laughs> yeah. thousands of those shirts because I used to go to tons of Christian concerts and conferences and music festivals. I remember I've, I bought a poster that was like Christian. Like it was like a Facebook thing where like it had like Jesus. If Jesus had like a Facebook account, the like Christian book. Yeah, I've seen those. Yeah. And it was yeah. I and I had a you know I had a bunch of those. Did you ever get the poster where it's like? Uh, the guy's taking heroin, but Jesus's arm is there instead. That's tattooed on my chest, man. That's just Dude, a powerful message. That, those, <laughs> that art's awesome. <laughs> right. There's tons of that stuff. It's corny and maybe yeah. it's well-meaning, but it just comes off. It's like the Christian version of like a Velvet Elvis painting, you know, but <laughs> I can only imagine sort of stands in this weird place where if, if most other Christian music is like Ice Ice Baby or Rico Suave or any of these other like one hit wonders that we look at as kind of being of their time. Uh, I can only imagine is definitely I'm trying to think of a good parallel, which is something that was it's like country roads where, yeah, it's overplayed and everyone kind of laughs at it. But when it hits, you're just like, oh, man, this is the best, you know? Yeah. And I can imagine definitely sort of hits that place. So that all that said, I was very skeptical about the idea of making a movie about the song that seems because there said a touched by an angel episode that's like this, but for the song um, "Testify to Love" by Avalon. What's touched by an angel? Is this a show? You've never heard of "Touched by an Angel." The more I, so I was never super into like the evangelical culture, and then the more I learn about evangelical culture, the more I'm okay with that. 
So I don't I don't know anything about this stuff. I just don't. My first three albums were Nirvana in Utero, Queens of the Stone Age, um, three the uh, the one that has threes and sevens on it, and then I think like Muse Absolution. Those are my first three albums. Those are good records. Yes. <laughs> so I don't I don't know any of this stuff. <laughs> That's why you're introducing this episode, Daniel, because <laughs> I don't know. I just don't. <laughs> Not to blow up our spot. There's a there's a great podcast called Good Christian Fun, which is just they bring in different guests to talk about various things from like their childhood is like there's a recent episode talking about newsboys which newsboys i don't know if, you, if anyone listening to this has recently gone back and listened to like breakfast and stuff their music holds up shockingly well because it was so it was weird at the time but still weird but now it just stands out more because of how just odd their music was but yeah so i yeah on, we could do a whole show i think on just me introducing christian things to, to you but <laughs> Did you ever hear about the Bible? <laughs> <laughs> there's a New Testament. Um, there's Test by an Angel was everyone's grandmother's favorite show because it was a very nice, inoffensive television show. It was about three angels on earth doing the Lord's work where they would get into all kinds of, I don't want to say hijinks because that implies more like slapstick and, and fun than it did. Basically, they would get sent to people who are going through difficulties and they would very subtly guide them and give them assistance to help them find the right path. The show has a shockingly high list of guest stars and stuff. Uh, one particular one that does not age well is Bill Cosby appeared in several episodes as an angel. Oof. So big oof. It's sad because like one of his episodes is actually really good because his son had recently died. And so he did an episode where he was talking to a guy about reconnecting with his son before one of them was going to die. But yeah, so Touched by the Angel, it aired on PAX, which the thing for PAX was that it was like a mainstream television channel, but it very clearly catered to Christian audiences. And this is especially big during the time where like MTV and Comedy Central and South Park and Marilyn Manson are ruining everything, apparently. So it was so it seems like a counterbalance to all that big, bad, naughty TV out there. So Touched by an Angel was a program that a lot of Christians really liked. And it had a lot of very overt evangelical, like Judeo-Christian thing where every episode would end with one of the main characters literally telling someone that God loves them and, you know, Jesus cares about them and all that stuff. So like... As cheesy and corny as the show is, I don't really have any sort of venom or dislike for the show because for like seven or eight seasons, they just talked about Jesus and I can't really hate that. But there's a particular episode where they took a Christian song, which is a real song that exists that I had heard in church and stuff called Testify of Love, and they made up a fake backstory for the person who wrote it where they like explained that these angels helped inspire this woman to write this song who is not the actual writer of the song. And then they made a sequel episode where they helped her regain her love for singing the song again. It's very weird because that's not what happened. And it's not like a secret right. or something like, yeah, it's strange. So I was worried this would be kind of like that where they come up with some weird fake backstory for why he wrote. I can only imagine. And they actually only make slight changes of story. I did a slight amount of research around this because mm -hmm. I am somewhat familiar with the artist and mercy me and all that stuff. And I was in, and I kind of know some of the backstory for why he wrote the song. And they actually didn't do a lot to dress up the story, which is both a strength and in some ways a weakness. But so this for, just to start off, like this is actually a fairly accurate representation of both the lead singer's life and why he wrote. I can only imagine. And so, yeah, it's I don't know how you want me to segue away from it. But yeah, so I can only imagine is a towering hit of Christian music and a beloved staple of christian culture they talk about how it's the number one christian song and by some metrics it is it is the most played christian song on radio it's the most requested song on radio part of how the song got popular in the first place is people would write into radio stations to get them to play it which they actually briefly include in the movie which i thought was a nice touch and because of its staple as just constantly used at funerals and stuff it just will forever be played it they can never sell another cd for the rest of our lives but they will forever make money on royalties due to its usage in yeah funerals and church services and things like that it's like one it sounds like one of those cases where like um i forget who sang 500 miles but like they the guys who sang that song the proclaimers yeah, they're basically like we will never release an album or do anything that that is of more that is of more value of the song. And I think like there's even a quote that's like the song kind of goes beyond us. <laughs> Just like there's nothing we 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 can't there's nothing that we could do to ever like top it or something like that because I I know that that one um that that's what this sounds like where it's like I can only imagine as a song is sort of transformed into its own thing. 
and there's nothing Mercy Me could ever do to basically make a new like top hit yeah. or anything like that. Hot hot take: the Proclaimers cover of Whole Wide World is better than 500 Miles. You heard it here first, folks. I don't know if I've heard it, so I guess I'll yeah. have to tune in. That's the, that's the type of cutting commentary and hot takes that people tune in for. Tune are, in for are really yeah. intense proclaimers uh, opinions. But yeah, <laughs> the thing is, like Mercy Me, have a, they still make music? They still do right. stuff. I've seen them live. They they'll never stop cranking out records. And part of it's because the lead singer, who things like what Bart 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 Millard Millard, that's his last name. He genuinely loves the Lord and he genuinely loves making music and he genuinely loves praising the Lord. And so as much as I think their music is just boring and <laughs> uninteresting, him as a person, I have no problems with. He's still making music. He makes it because mm-hmm. he loves worshiping the Lord. And so, yeah, I'm just going to get up at the top at the top of the episode. I don't like Mercy Me's music. It's boring. It's uninteresting. It's bland. It sounds like elevator music. But them as people, I will probably never, unless right when we release this album, I mean, album, right when we release this episode, some horrible controversy comes out. Until that happens, I will never say a bad word about them. So. In this moment, at this time, <laughs> as of this recording, yeah, Bart Miller, this is Daniel's. He just posts a picture of himself in like a furry suit <laughs> on the internet. Like, like this is who I am now. Yikes! I can only imagine. <laughs> I can. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. So, I mean, do you want to talk about the movie? <laughs> or... <laughs> I am. Um, yeah. I mean, I, as the move, like, yeah, I have no connection to the song. I don't really have any connection to this. It's, it's not something where like Bohemian Rhapsody is somewhat saved as a movie by the fact that I like queen music or that I, oh, it's that song. I like, I like that song. Do, do, I do, like do, it. Do, do. Um, do, do, and so, do, do, do. Yeah, exactly. This was a movie where basically like, Amy Grant coming on screen doesn't mean anything to me. Um, she looks a lot like Amy Grant at the time. I'll give that to whoever plays Amy Grant in this movie. Is that who the actor was? That's or, not. Amy, so it was someone. It's not really Amy Grant, but yeah, it was someone playing a younger version of Amy Grant. See, that's I wouldn't know that. I had no idea. I'm thinking here, like, man, this probably hits someone who really likes that person. <laughs> it's like it's not actually them. <laughs> this is not God's Not Dead, where they just have a parade of Christian figures that just show up to be like, hello, yeah. it's me, Duck Dynasty, you know? Right. And everyone's like, yeah. <laughs> it's Yeah, because they're the people like to idol worship people instead of, I guess, I don't know. But um, yeah, so it's like, I, it, th- none of that stuff worked on me, which is fine. It's not a movie's more than just its references, but references do improve or in, make a scene a bit more enjoyable. But anyways, this, this movie kind of gave me the same syndrome that A Beautiful Mind gives me um where the scenes <laughs> the first time in the mil- in, in his human history someone compared i can only imagine a beautiful mind or just that anyone mentions it because that's sort of like a staple of the i forgot i watched that canon but um a beautiful mind kind of as as a movie feels like a series of scenes that were just stitched together as opposed to a coherent single movie so it always like this movie and that movie always feel like I'm being reintroduced to the characters in every single scene. And then it's like, it's like a series of YouTube clips. And so like, I don't know, this movie had that syndrome where like every scene that's happened or happening, I never felt like it was connected together. I also thought that this movie was a bit overly edited. I think some of its scenes would have been improved by letting us breathe or even letting us feel bad. Cause like the, 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 the I don't I don't know if you even mentioned it in introducing the, the movie, but the whole point is that the song is influenced by the fact that Bart Millard's dad was abusive and then at some point came to know the Lord. Right. And the movie, like when it wants to show that his dad was a monster it, at a point in his life, um, had acted monstrous. Um, the movie doesn't let you kind of linger on that misery long. And so as if to say, like, we have to be careful with the audience. And it's not even like because we might trigger the audience. It's more like because Christians aren't allowed to feel bad. And I, I just wish it kind of did more of that. So I guess that's like, what, three things. This <laughs> um, never really felt like a, a linear movie, overly edited at times with a lot of music and like a lot of color correction. Yes. So much color correction. The whole movie has the same vibe because... So the Urban Brothers, who who are the primary creatives behind the film, they they if you look through the director filmography, it is exclusively. I mean, it's all all Christian films, 
some people may know them as the directors behind a little movie called bat like mom's night out i don't know if you remember this movie no no wait is that that pure flicks movie i think it might be pure flicks but yeah it's um it was their attempt at making a christian version of like a crazy ridiculous one 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 mad night kind of comedy it was hangover yeah. it was like their version of hangover specifically it seemed like almost like a mockbuster of bad moms but that movie was terrible it's so but it also has trace adkins in it who plays the uh he's a country singer but primarily but he also plays like the record guy in this movie who like supports and believes in the band and comes with them on tour so i don't know if they just are friends with trace adkins but their bread and butter is christian movies but that specifically focus on inspiring true stories because they did a football movie with sean astin before this mm-hmm. but like all of their movies ha- are like this like they're almost like big budget hallmark movies where they all have this like the same color filter over them where it always is supposed to have this like cloying inspirational feel to it do they also feel like they're imitating movies because this movie doesn't feel like a movie it feels like it's imitating movies it feels like it feels like you know how like an actor is supposed to perform as somebody it feels like the whole movie is acting like a movie now i'm not i everything i've said makes it sound like i didn't like the movie i liked it but i also didn't like it was like it's like a (laughs) five to six out of ten kind of movie for me like i just wasn't it wasn't making me feel great because like even in the beginning the first 10 minutes are just kid actors and it's not it's it's a struggle (laughs) it was a struggle to sit through it (laughs) it definitely starts off not strong and it has like two introductions it's like there's the kid scenes and then there's the teenager scenes and i what what got me a genuine laugh is um there's the kid scenes and then it jumps forward he's saying and then i did the only thing i knew my dad liked and it shows him as a footballer and the first line is with that beard you look like you're 35 yeah totally lost appreciate it. it yeah because it was like the, the actor's clearly 35 and not a high schooler <laughs> and i was like hey that's good <laughs> but then it kind of you know then it goes back to imitating a movie. Yes, which is interesting because I was going to save this for later, but you and I have both been recommended this movie more than once. Yeah, I've had a lot of people say, hey, it's really good. It's a good Christian movie. Yes, it's a good Christian movie. Like, let's yeah. let that hang in the air for a second. You know, I'm going to get that tattooed on my forehead at some point because <laughs> I have so and so many a movie has been a sold tramp stamp that says, have you watched The Chosen? Yeah. <laughs> It's just, yeah, I, these, I need to get like a filter. Like you can filter things on Twitter. I need to get that filtered out for like my phone for texting. Cause I just, and to be fair, I can only imagine is definitely one of the better Christian films I've seen. I'm just going to get that out there. Cause I know that's what people want. It is parsable, but it's like, it is because it just does all the things movies should where it has characters. It has, they went ahead and got real actors. Chloris, the great Chloris Leachman shows up for like, five minutes of screen time mercy me yeah cloris leachman shows up for like five minutes of screen time as his mima and she's great cloris leachman is one of the most underappreciated character actors of all time everyone knows and loves her she's in tons of stuff but she's in this dennis quaid is just the one of the best movie dads to ever movie dad yeah he's like he's a good performer he's, he's actually really so i good really enjoyed this. his presence in this he does a he he has an aura about him that when he's on set you know that like you could probably, if you were directing him, you could give him one line. He'll be like, "I got it." Like he <laughs> he seems very much in control of what he's doing. I when I was when I was in high school and middle school and high school, I started writing. You know, I wanted to I wanted to be a filmmaker when I was younger. Obviously, is everyone who has a movie podcast did, and I started writing a screenplay about my dad. If my dad had become a professional wrestler, and I was like, Dennis Quaid is going to play my dad. I want Dennis Quaid to play Heck my yeah. dad because yeah. he should play every dad because he is every dad. And in this one, he mm-hmm. he brings a menace and genuine danger to the character that I don't think anyone else could. Like, he's the only person in the movie that I 100 percent believe is the person he is. Yes. And every every standout scene in the movie has him in it because he plays the sheer like the drunken angry dad thing perfectly and then when he plays a dad who's trying to make amends later in the movie he does that perfectly yeah he's he's so good in this the strongest scene in the movie is that scene the when when um bart gets back home 
and then his dad is reformed, but is like, I don't, I don't understand. I'm reading a lot of books that I don't understand. It's like that's a it's great like Leviticus doesn't make any sense. <laughs> like, yeah, what the heck's the, like? <laughs> yeah, I know, buddy. <laughs> it's crazy. I, oh man. Yeah. The, the, for me, the best scene in the movie is the scene where like he's trying to get his dad to come see him sing at church, and his dad like just breaks a plate over his head. Yeah, that scene good. felt so real and so. Like it, it, I was like, this has to be like something that really happened, and it did. Yeah. That is verbatim of thing that happened to the to uh, the real Bart Millard. He was on set the day they filmed that, and he said he started to cry watching it because it was exactly as he remembers it. Oof, yeah, that would be very rough. Yeah, so that stuff is all that stuff is very very strong. But it's interesting, like because I had a similar issue with the structure because it's it's structured like people who've seen a movie, like they understand that there's a certain beats and there's a certain rhythm to the sort of a story where, you know, you, you get the humble beginnings, but his dad isn't good. Then he starts chasing his dream and you know, his dad doesn't believe in him. Then it turns out he's really good at the singing thing. And so he goes home to make amends with his father and his father comes you know, in this case, the Christian spin is his father comes to the Lord, gets saved and his father's death. And literally something his grandma said, which is, I wonder what it's like up there, inspires him to write a song about his father. And then he ha- and then his what is it? His notebook has the um, insanity wall, except in a notebook where he just has written, I can only imagine a bajillion times. <laughs> That's also a real thing that happened. To is that real? Singer. So uh, one of the things that they there's a cup. This movie's very accurate up until the actual I can only imagine part, which we can get into later. And the fact that he doesn't have any brothers. <laughs> yeah, he also has a brother. But uh, yeah. he. He said, like, because he did not write, I can only imagine, right after his father died. He took him years because his dad dies in 1991. They don't release the song until like 10 years later. Well, actually, eight, eight or nine years later. And then it was re released on their debut album in 2001, which is when it got really big. But yeah, he spent, he said he spent years just writing that phrase over and over again. It's almost like a form of OCD because he just mm. couldn't get it out of his head. So. If you want to have another comparison to a beautiful mind, there you go. <laughs> yeah, uh, similar go. the the similar yeah. type of writing. So yeah, and then you write the song, and then the song gets big, and the band becomes popular, and then a text about how successful the band was after re- roll of the credits. You know, it's all those beats are present in this film. And if it sounds like there's not much plot, that's because there really isn't. And it, it really is felt like. Yeah. It, it almost felt like they were trying to find drama in the story, which you could have totally had. I I said to my wife, I would have liked. If the bulk of the movie was the reconciliation between him and him and his dad, like I even I even pitched a scene to my wife, as all podcasters do when they watch a movie. <laughs> um, and I was like, imagine he comes home and they don't do a They don't do a breakfast scene right away. Um, he comes home. He meets his dad. He's there. He decides he's going to forgive his dad. You get that scene. But then it's like the next 20 minutes or 30 minutes is scenes of him being with his dad. But then the having to deal with the triggers that happens with like, we're reconciling our relationship, but this is a process. So then finally, like you, you, you had your pivotal scene in the past where his dad hits him with a plate. Um, so you know that that's a serious thing. Then you have this scene later where it's finally, Hey son, let's have breakfast together. And you're in the audience going, the last time they had breakfast together, it was a scary scene. So now you're getting this mounting drama of like, he's going to choose where to sit. He chooses to sit on the other side. So there's no way that his dad can get behind him. They're eating their food, but he's sort of feeling sick eating his food. So he can't eat it. And then you get the scene of like, dad, I've forgiven you, but inside me, I still feel unsafe. I still feel this. And then his dad's like, I'm so sorry that this is what happened. And then you continue to pro- the process like, because that's kind of what it looks like in real life is a continued process of even just smells taking you back that trigger you and make you feel unsafe. That's what panic attacks are, is a a sensation gets triggered and your body then goes, I'm in danger, even though you're not in danger at all. And I would have really enjoyed seeing that process because it would, as an audience member, create more drama for me to participate in. Because you may have, you may see the dad is reforming and then the son is forgiving but then there may be scenes where the dad loses it because he still has the flesh taking over sometimes trying to want the temptation of the flesh to be mad to be angry to take control is still there i don't know that would have been really interesting it mm. would have added more to the rising action it would have made the transition of him dying into like saying dad can you sing for me when i'm dying kind of thing i don't know it would have just been like 
it would have been the exercise of what faith and forgiveness is, which is a race. It is the perseverance race that we're all called to run. That would have been cool. But because it's imitating a movie and then it's also imitating the feel good feel goodery of um, the Christian movie canon, it's like the second he writes, I forgive my dad. And then the next 15 minutes are constant music, constant editing, and then he dies. <laughs> like it's, you don't actually see any process going on. Like there's even a scene of like him writing in his book, I finally have the dad I want and he's dying. How's that fair? Wow, I'd love to see that exercised in the movie. Ah, never mind. I mean, you might as well have just pulled the room where it's like, I definitely have breast cancer and then never bring it up again. Because that's a really interesting plot development, an, an internal exercise. And then it's not done. Then we just go back to Bart Miller being a musician again. And it's like a beautiful mind where even in a beautiful mind in the last sequences, I'm getting an award and I just get a speech that describes the movie. I don't know. It's I, I wanted a bit more and it's fine what I got. And not all biopics about musicians can be Rocket Man, but even that movie is more of a musical. But like, I don't know. I just wanted to be more in the mire and we weren't in the mire that long because it was too scared to make you feel bad. It felt like. Mm. Yeah, honestly, like I to me, like I honestly thought the movie was pretty good for what it was like. There's a there's a point with a lot of films where you just accept what they are like. Right. This movie yes. is not trying to be anything particularly ambitious. It has its story. But like I said, like it does feel kind of like I don't know if you, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know how big a Weird Al fan you are. I've dabbled in a couple <laughs> uh, white nerdies before. Uh, but when Weird Al, they did a behind the music on Weird Al. The problem with Weird Al is. First off, I don't know if this is well known, but I'm pretty sure he's a Christian. Like, I know that he attends church regularly, and I've heard accounts of people who say they've gone to church with Weird Al and say he's a really nice guy. And it also probably lends screens to why, even though he does like comedy parody songs, they're never particularly vulgar or anything like that. So he's maintained a pretty clean, family friendly image for most of his career. He is he is uncancelable. You could you could never cancel never him. Ne under no circumstances super straight edge you know you could try and be like oh he's appropriate culture well, you know whatever it's it's parody that's parody is literally just that so I don't know what yeah. you want from the guy but when they did it behind the music on him there's no drugs there's no infidelity there's no wild partying they they were literally trying to find things to make more dramatic in a story so to compensate for that they like tried to like play up things like the coolio lawsuit the fact that uhf wasn't a huge fi financial hit All, they tried to like make those things much more dramatic and downer a bigger downer for him than they really were because they're trying to find things for that and that's kind of what a lot of this movie felt like where they're trying to make the whole like his band won't make it like a bigger thing even though we don't know the bandmates at all as characters they're yeah, just they're barely in the movie white bros. it's very yeah. weird and like they tried to like find all this drama, which is like, as you're highlighting is weird because there's plenty of drama here. The primary drama is there and we never really do it. Yeah. You could have a whole movie. I'm sure there are movies that are just about someone going back home and reconciling with family. Probably a cheaper budget. Whole two hour films, you know? Yeah. And you probably wouldn't have to like get locations for all these like scenes of them yeah. playing music and stuff. And I, I think that like they maybe were worried because the music thing is the marketable point. Like people are going to see this movie because they like the song or because they're mercy me fans or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so not focusing on that stuff might potentially alienate kind of part of your audience. I assume where people who want to see like the band, they, they want to see like a Bohemian Rhapsody rocket man, Someone said this is Final Tap, but you know what are those types of movies? <laughs> the dirt, the dirt. <laughs> oh my god, what a disaster! That'd be horrible. Ugh. Neil Strauss, bad author. Um, we cannot say any of the same thing about Bart Millard. He and again, this it works against the movie in some ways, where he's such a nice guy that there just isn't much to dig into as far as drama. Like his yeah. his beef with his dad makes so much sense; it's so understandable. But there's so much about him as a person where like he loves his dad he he's a christian you know he he believes in redemption and grace and so they don't i don't know if they just didn't want to draw it out or it wouldn't have been accurate to the story because there's also a thing here where almost all of the beats of everything leading up to the writing of i can only imagine is just what happened and so there's a sense where they they didn't i don't know if they were just uncomfortable drawing anything out or dressing it up or trying to make it more dramatic the only thing they added was they made his dad an alcoholic in the movie, which isn't what happened in real life. In real life, he was just very angry. Did they imply he was an alcoholic? Because he wasn't really drinking in the movie. 
It, what, they, I don't even think they show a single drop of alcohol in the movie. I think it's implied early on. I know where, he's slurring. Yeah. Like he's slurring and he basically sounds out of it. But that also I didn't I couldn't separate whether that was Southern twang where it's just like, I'm sorry, sir. I don't know what you're saying. Well, no and one else talks like that the whole movie. <laughs> so True. But yeah. So, yeah, I don't I don't I don't know if they just were uncomfortable with with drama like adding more drama to a true story than than they wanted or something but yeah there's a whole because there's a whole story here that isn't being told which is kind of a shame but at the same time like it's it's when it is on screen it's the strongest stuff in the movie by a huge margin where i think that's partially why this movie is often seen as so much better than other christian films because the core of the story is the father-son relationship. There is this element of religion, and ultimately that's what redeems the characters, where is his father finding finding oh is 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 you know his father becoming saved and Bart's, you know, his relationship with God helping him to forgive his dad. So like those elements are there to make the religious office happy happy. It is what happened. That's a that's the true story. And so it is def- definitely a religious film, but at its core, it's a story about a father and son reconciling, which I think is what carries the movie to the heights that it does as far as its view among christians and in fact it has like an overall good reviews like it, it's like i think it's at like 67 68 percent rotten tomatoes which is unusual for a christian film it's generally regarded as pretty good yeah and which and also it, it shows when you get anything else in the movie is kind of just dead air like all the stuff with the band trying to make it there's a good scene where like i think it's a little overdone or when people are giving his band bad reviews he remembers his dad telling him he ain't gonna be nothing you know yeah i thought that was pretty decent that's but that's just the trope in movies that i like is when you have because that's how memories work is in the midst of something that takes you back it's almost like you're re-experiencing a lie or traumatic or events or something right. like that. So I thought that was cool. But again, it was like, it was like a scene. It was like a series of scenes <laughs> that didn't really connect to each other. Yeah. It's the flow between the stuff of his dad and the stuff with the band isn't good. And I, there's a multiple moments where I wondered if not to be snobby, but I was like, there's, there's a more artful way to do this. Where like the scene with the, with the record executives telling him his band's no good and they're not going to make it like, it just cuts back to previous scenes in the movie. And I feel like there might have been like maybe they could have just had I don't know if Dennis Quaid just didn't have that many dates <laughs> available or something. But yeah. like I would have liked it if like they just added him to the crowd there. Where in between that you just saw him like standing behind the executives making comments. You mean like at the end when he's singing and, <laughs> yeah. and he pulls like, a Shia LaBeouf and he's the only guy in the audience that yeah, stands up. That that too. Those are the two <laughs> moments where I was like, there's a more artful way to do this. Like, yeah. like again, I would have liked it if the crowd was cheering and looks up and it just sees his dad. In the crowd. And everybody's face is Dennis Quaid. <laughs> yeah. Well, not that, but different Dennis Quaid <laughs> from all the movies fake, he's in. Yeah. Dennis Quaid's face. It's just the crowd from Space Jam and New Legacy, but like it's all Quaid's. Runs up to hug his girlfriend and it's just Dennis Quaid's face. <laughs> <laughs> uh, glad you didn't let her go, son. You know, whatever. <laughs> That'd be great. I, I have one big issue with the movie outside of the like, minor quibbles, but oh, I'm curious. I, I don't know if you have a... Uh... Well, I just... I um, I just... I th- th- this discussion makes me think of like, well, why why did I enjoy Rocket Man more than Bohemian Rhapsody? And it's because uh, Rocket Man is about memories are more experienced through concepts than are th- conceptually than they are through history. And what makes Rocket Man a really interesting movie, which I'm not necessarily recommending everyone go watch right now, but but Rocket Man tells a story about an experience. That Elton, the the experience of being basically Elton John with the flamboyance of Elton John, and it captures a lot of his life to the point that even Elton John, when he watched it premiere at Cannes, was just like sobbing the entire movie because he's like, it's so accurate, even though it's like everyone's dancing in the middle of the street um, and songs are being put in different parts of the timeline. But the whole point is, it's about like learning to love oneself and. Then you have something like Bohemian Rhapsody, which is apart from the fact that it's a horribly edited, sickening movie, and not because of the, the movie itself, but because there are literal scenes that make me sick when I watch them because they're edited so poorly. Um, that dinner scene is rough. But um, that one tries to capture historical events, but does it so poorly that it's actually kind of boring to watch. And I think like this movie, I can only imagine if it just wanted to capture the experience 
of reconciling a relationship with an abusive father, I think there it could have been more impactful than if it just wanted to capture like events in a man's life, if that makes any sense. Because by getting into a lot of the band stuff and having it be basically this B or C plot, it yeah, like you said, it draws away from the primary drama, the primary plot line, when if it all just fed into the drama of the family, like what if we're we're talking, what if the whole movie is him reconciling with his dad, and then we're doing cutaways to when he was in the band, and how stuff with his dad affected him. And he's like, because of how you treated me and set my life up, I never felt secure in getting criticism. And there is this time when a bunch of when we played a concert and a bunch of executives said we weren't good. And this is how I reacted because all I could think of was your face saying, you know, dreams don't matter and you'll never get them kind of thing. It just, yeah, it just, I wish, I wish the movie was less about the band. And even at the end when the credits, they do the crazy credits where it's like telling you about their real life. More of it's just, more of it's just about the band than him and his dad. And more of it's about the song I can only imagine than him and his dad. And I would have, enjoyed more of it talking about him and his dad i don't know i just yeah but i don't want to keep rehearsing the same yeah. thing over and over the power of the story is i mean the god's redemptive work in their lives and the context right. it gives i can only imagine you know so because everyone everyone and their mother has heard this song at a funeral right and so it's a powerful song that they already like so the the punch comes from the fact that like wow i had no idea that this whole time he was singing about his father and how he's so happy that his dad is now in God's presence and that one day he'll get to see his father again in heaven. And, yeah. you know, it gives this song this context. And so that's an easy layup. And so in that regard, the movie doesn't ruin that or miss that mark because that yeah. is intrinsic to the story. But it would have hit so much harder if we had spent more time with his dad, both as an abuser and as a reconciler. Yeah. So like cut. Cut 40 minutes from this movie. Cut almost his entire story with his girlfriend. Or, you know, yeah, how does that, that feed? Like if it fed his <laughs> his perhaps lack of trust, of intimacy and care, then maybe that would have been interesting. But it's not like there's any drama with that. I mean, the say the way it starts is exactly how it ends. We're gonna get married and we have a destiny together and then there's not much destiny, but you did get married. <laughs> yeah, it feels like <laughs> okay. it feels because it starts strong. Like the relationship with him and his girlfriend is totally fine. I liked it. It's the them as kids is cute. The fact I don't know that if it was like, strong, but I guess yeah. Well, it's like I he, get what you're saying. He yeah he him and his girlfriend break up because because of the issues with his dad. So it all ties together. We can see how his abusive father is not just affecting him personally, but it's affecting all his relationships. And that's good stuff. And later in the movie, you know, maybe his girlfriend could have showed up and help, helped him with his relationship with his dad or helped him take care of his father when he's sick or something, which I don't know if that's, that happened or not. So they didn't do that. But then it just becomes a periodic thing we're reminded of. Like he just will occasionally call his girlfriend. But like, guess what? Don't forget. Girls exist. Don't forget. Don't forget. I'm in a band. <laughs> is like what happens. And then she just shows up at the end of the movie and they hug, which I also have a problem with, which we'll get into in a second. But I keep keep yeah, keep lampshading that. that's We're interesting get into it but it's just like why was this in the movie like it doesn't yeah. go anywhere yeah so cut all of that is either either don't have either do it well or don't have it at all cut all of that give all that time to more stuff which i don't know if they just couldn't afford dennis quaid for more scenes or something but that's the stuff in the movie that works that's the stuff in the movie that's strong that's the stuff in the movie that also ties into what you're trying to do which is make me get sadder but i can really imagine so yeah Feeling sad is great. <laughs> like when it's fictional, when it's real life, it sucks. But like feeling sad in a fictional set setting is part of the experience of watching a movie. So let me feel sad. Let me feel dread. Let me feel fear. Because then when you get to the redemption of the father, first off, it transitions that sadness and anger that we have towards the father onto Bart Millard. It's still rational that bart miller it's like god can forgive you but i can't like i get it dude i'm with you <laughs> like that's right. fair but it also still like that that experience of transitioning our frustrations of like bart like he's he's doing it he's doing what you've always wanted he's learning to get better like that's what makes movies and fiction fun because then it's also what 
we do in real life. It's also how we experience life and that's what's fun but then the movie just doesn't want us to linger on it because it's like hey amy grant remember her she's real like that's a that's a person on this earth but it didn't it didn't hit me because i didn't know who that was <laughs> but like anyways it's it is it's frustrating but i guess yeah if you want to put it in the if you want to put it on the christian movie curve i guess this is up there but it's like i don't know it's just it's it is a movie that exists but you, you're, you're frustrated about a hug. What is this? What is, oh. is the hug not canon to the real so, world? Um, despite what we're saying, I do think one of the strengths of the film is that it's just this is what happened. You know, they didn't add anything for drama, for better or for worse. And it gives the film the sort of genuineness that I think is charming. Like the lack of incident is also kind of what I weirdly like about it. Because and I'm sure the core audience will, too, because they're not looking for a difficult watch they they're looking for yeah you know, it's not a, that challenging it's a feel good and it's partially why i don't i'm not a huge fan of inspirational stories in general it's because i don't know i just the whole inspirational film drama doesn't do much for me unless it's like this insane true story that you just have to see to believe like as much as it was oscar bait i like the movie lion because that's just a bizarre over-the-top story that really happened and it's beautiful to see it unfold before your eyes so I can only imagine, you know, it's not as adventurous or interesting as a movie like that, but it, it, there is a charm to just the simple story where a guy and his dad get together and he writes a song. Where the movie finally diverts from reality is in the lead up to the first performance that I can only imagine. Now, in real life, they did, in fact, intend to sell the song to Amy Grant. And for those who do not know, this is a pretty common thing that happens where musicians and artists will write songs. And for whatever reason, they may not decide to perform it themselves. They'll sell, sell it off to different artists and musicians. Um, you know, I Will Always Love You is most famous, not by this writer, Dolly Parton, for example, you know. So what in real life, first off, I can see why they left this part out, which is initially the hesitation wasn't because they thought the song was so beautiful. It's because Amy Grant at the time was going through a not well-received divorce. And so, which in you know, most music, most music industry stuff, divorce is not a huge issue. You know, musicians go through partners like crazy. But Amy Grant was divorcing her husband at the time. And this was seen as potentially not good uh, for both her career and anyone associated with her. Because the Christian community, for those who don't know, scandals like this hit a lot harder for various reasons. Uh, in the end, though, Bart decided after thinking about it that he would, in fact, sell the song to Amy Grant, despite the fact she was getting divorced at the time. And so, but then Amy Grant, decided not to do the song herself for whatever reason. And so they eventually met up before a show and Amy Grant decided to give the song back to him. And then they did in fact perform it together. This is not what, how it plays in the movie. And I was watching the movie and as this scene was unfolding, it was the first time I was like, this can't be real. This is too cheesy, too corny, too saccharine. And it's just silly, like especially compared to the rest of the movie, which is really grounded for what it is. It's a very realistic, no frills movie. And suddenly there's this big, sappy, inspirational movie moment that is just silly. It's I'm sorry. The whole scene is just silly where she's tries to sing. I can only imagine she can't finish it. And Bart's in the audience. So she calls up on stage. He starts to sing the song. And then the record producer, this whole movie's down them is also in the audience. And his girlfriend, who's strange, is also in the audience. Everyone's there. They're all hugging at the end. And it's just silly. And it's not what happens. It's not at all what happens. It's totally phony and fake. It feels phony and fake watching the movie. And it's the one part of the movie that I'm like, I just don't like it. Like, it's just not, it's not what happened. And it's frustrating because it's the ones, because it feels like they didn't know how to end the movie. Because the movie had so little incident like a logical endpoint would have been to end it after his father dies and they write the song. And right. then you just cut to them performing it at the, at the white house, even, you know, that would have been a fine ending, but they needed a dramatic ending. I was even thinking that the through line, first off, I thought he was being interviewed on a radio show. Yes. Not being, I thought yeah. the same thing. So I was like, that's how you end it is you end with like, and he's now, on the this radio song show, you all want to hear, the song, you know, and then it's like, and then you can do the thing that I guess is in, is it, is this, first off, is this a recurrent thing? And now this is about a musician and about a band, but like, is it a recurrent thing for Christian movies to just end with a concert? Cause I know God's not dead does that with the first two movies, <laughs> but, <laughs> <laughs> like a lion. which is weird as, as Kevin Sorbo dies on the yeah, street. Uh, one of the good. funniest movies I've ever seen. <laughs> it's so funny. We'll, have to, we'll have to watch oh, it. Maybe we should do so a commentary good. track. It'd be great. But, um, but 
is that like a thing? Because like that's what this feels like. Because you could still technically do that if you did. It was a radio show. The end of the movie is he dies. And then on the radio, they play the song or it's just it's one of those like, sp- you know, how there's like Spotify sessions where it's like, hey, we have you come in on the radio and just play yeah, a couple yeah, tracks yeah. live. It's yeah, like here like he is playing live it live or, on the radio. Yeah. And then you have a scene where it's like they're you can see where the where the song's playing and who's tuned in. It's jumps around. Ooh, it should have been a tiny desk concert. Like, I don't know. Like, you can cool. do that. But then like, is yeah. So is this like a thing? Is this in other Christian movies? <laughs> Yeah, we'll see if like heaven is for real ends with the <laughs> concert or oh uh, god, I hate that movie. But um, I've never even seen it. I I don't know. That's a good point. I didn't even realize that. Isn't that the one where the girl actually said, "Just kidding, I was lying." Yeah, she admitted she made it up. Made it up. Yeah. Oops. Chris, Christians love that stuff. So lying. Oh, I, I I'm not well <laughs> heaven, but <laughs> Christians do be like lying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a it's such a phony fake way to end the movie. And it doesn't gel with the rest of the tone of the movie either. What's the tone of the movie, though? I didn't really. It has this such a grounded, not overdone. Like, it's such a mild movie that it was for me, it was weird for it to suddenly try and racket it up to 11 to have this big inspirational moment. Like, it doesn't fit the rest, the rest of the movie, even though the soundtrack <laughs> won't shut up. They it's could've... strangely quiet. Like, it's they could have made him launch into space on a rocket <laughs> and then explode like in Rocket Man. <laughs> <laughs> they could have. They should have. <laughs> I, I don't know if I'll agree I can only have. imagine. Mm-hmm. And he just. <laughs> and he I'm into coming, space. Dad. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Rides a rocket uh what a good movie because it's it, it, it opens up this whole thing of like if you're gonna make up that stuff why not make up more stuff the rest of the movie i don't know like it's, yeah it's a weird like bird of the candle both ends in a bad way kind of situation where they make up this whole fake final concert where he finally or an emotional moment amy grant cannot sing the song because it's so beautiful and not her song it's not her story to tell and she brings up bart onto the stage and it's just it felt fake watching it, and I was very validated later reading that that's not what happened. Mm-hmm. You know, so like, yeah, I, 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 again, a more artful way would if like, if what if early in the movie when it was like, you know, sing for me, it just cuts away, and then later it cuts to them singing. I can only imagine, and then like, you know, you just interlope those scenes together, and so it's like where it feels like to him he's singing the song for his dad. You know, it's the song he wished he could have sang for his father, you know, or something as opposed to just a room where everyone gives him a standing ovation because they heard I can only imagine, which I doubt that happened because I don't know if you've ever been to a concert. But when an artist plays a song you've never heard before, everyone does not like it. It's kind of the worst. They yeah, don't if like you go it. To a, <laughs> yeah. Concerts are so the audience can participate with the band so you can sing along with it. I even went to, um, there's an artist called, there's a group called Chan and they're, Oh yeah, rock. I've seen Sean. They're super great. good. Yeah. I saw that was good. Good. Um, I saw it on their, um, super Chan bros tour or whatever. And like, there was a song or who two. They pl- who they play played. with? They, I had Trico, okay. which is a Japanese band. So that was dope. But then I bought a shirt and the guy convinced me that they size too large. So I got a medium and it turns out it didn't fit. So now I can never, I'll probably <laughs> never see this band again. Cause they were touring in these States for one time. Uh, it was Trico, another math rack band and TTNG. And then Sean, it was like a four hour concert and Sean came out uh, last. I was exhausted. <laughs> yeah. I saw them with a uh, tooth grinder and periphery. Nice. Uh, yeah. Even in the, a band that has no lyrics except for like three of their tracks. <laughs> People are participating by making guitar noises with their mouth. That's what they and did at the John, show you went to. That's what they did at the show wow. I went to. Yeah, people were just like <laughs> did not making do that my show. <laughs> guitar noises with their mouth. You went with a bunch of weirdos, dude. My show it they just awesome. like moshed. <laughs> it, yeah, we moshed. We went crazy, but it was like they're also just yeah, making guitar noises with their mouth. <laughs> and then of course they played "Can't Wait," which you knew they were going to do because they had a microphone out, and you're like, they why would they have a microphone? There's not a lot of songs they need these for. So. And they didn't play it until their encore, so you knew there was going to be an encore. Core. <laughs> they had an encore set list it's so funny but um that's what a concert is so yeah you can't imagine like hey here's a new song <laughs> like you've never heard before <laughs> and i yeah. you know when i went I, I i don't know if it was a michael w smith concert maybe it was if my mom's listening to this episode she'll tell me but like it was at a concert venue like the one in the movie and so everyone's just sitting anyway so it's yeah. like it's not really a concert it's more like I actually want to know if that's a CCM thing. 
Are um, they just treated like going to to a play where you just sit there and listen? So some bizarrely. So I I've seen um a couple different Christian. I like I saw Caveman's Call. I saw Third Day. I saw Jars of Clay. You just sit there. And yeah, a lot of those shows because the venues they play. Some of them they play a lot of venues that are just churches, so the seats are there. Yeah, it's weird. Like when I saw Caveman's Call, it was people were sitting. When I saw, you just fall asleep. You just yeah, look at I your phone. You don't even get to participate in the music. Is this because it's like a post Baptist thing where it's like dancing is evil? Don't do it. I don't know because it's 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 only these artists though. Like I saw Newsboys and they didn't do that. It was just in a concert venue. So you have to skip the part in uh, Second Kings when David dances because it's in. Don't do that. <laughs> and he's and he's naked. <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> well, the text implies that yeah. he's at least losing his garb, his kingly garb. So he's just in in like a loincloth. That's a good question, actually. I don't know if it's for theological reasons. Because I was actually just talking to, to some uh, leaders in my church recently because we're, we're, we're swapping stories. And uh, one of the people there went to Wheaton and a lot of his friends went to Moody. And Moody Bible College, at the time, you weren't allowed to dance. So people at their daughter's weddings didn't dance they didn't do the father daughter dance or anything because of moody's roles which is admirable they stuck to their convictions but i don't know how i feel about that and then i went to pentecostal bible college which also dancing is still technically not allowed i don't believe it is so I don't, that's a good question i don't know if it's because of different convictions as far as dancing goes but yeah a ton of the conserve like conserve the christian uh, contemporary Christian music concerts I went to didn't have dancing. And it's funny because I also went to um, a couple of different Christian music festivals that also booked like metal and rock acts. So you go to a show and they'd be like Project 86 and <laughs> Dope, you know, Under Oath and As Lay Dying and all these groups. But then they weren't sure if they wanted to do a lot of moshing. So at one point they had a section called a, what, uh, the Push Pit where you could... <laughs> push each other you could not mosh and then later years they try to make it where like you couldn't lift your arms so you could just kind of bump into each what? other and then if this every year they progressively had more restrict because they for them it's just a violence thing they weren't sure if they wanted to allow that but then you have artists like red and um like you know artists that like i saw he is legend he's not even like a christian band i don't know how they got on the bill uh but they were like yeah guys go crazy you know and all the stuff in the and the security guards are like please stop trying to get them to go crazy they cannot go crazy um it was just it's weird i don't know it's part of the energy i don't know but then like yeah when i saw switchfoot at the same show like john foreman was like climbing up on the ba- rafters and stuff like that so i don't know what like and he was like running through the crowd and stuff so i don't know if he just didn't get the memo or whatever but yeah, I don't like Christ, Christian music culture is so fascinating to me because music inherently causes all these things like self expression, movement, and people foot going tapping. Is foot, foot tapping? tapping it? It's yeah. Tapping your fingers, you know. Dancing and is wonderful. It's yeah. There's nothing wrong with dancing, in my opinion. I, I'm, it's I don't not know. sin. I, please yeah. send in your send in your thoughts of dancing if you disagree. But yeah, and, and be I, nice. I can't imagine moshing at an Amy Grant show as awesome as that would be. You know? <laughs> but yeah, the whole scene is just. It just does not land for me, especially the rest of the movie, which is so grounded in reality. Almost everything you see in the film, the only yeah, the only things that are not accurate is um, his father did not drink, and the time when he wrote, I can only imagine, is a little later than that. So from that point yeah. on, it's just fake inspirational movie hogwash. I don't, I don't, it, it, I did not like it at one bit, Melvin. I did not. So. <laughs> Yeah, I think what's I I just I just want something authentic and genuine. And a lot of the reason I don't watch uh, Christian movies is they never feel authentic or genuine. They feel like they just don't feel like they're living in the real world uh, a lot. And this one kind of played around in that area uh, every now and then, where it was like not the real world, and then but also like but it's subject matter. <laughs> I don't even know if I can say it's subject matter because it only spends like 20 minutes out of out of an hour and 50 minutes on the dad and son stuff. But that's why people are watching it because they're like, I like this movie because it's the only Christian movie where 20 minutes feel like real and then the rest don't. But like the the subject matter <laughs> with an asterisk next to it is there's no way you can't be real with that. And I, th- and, and I just wanted like more of that. I don't know. I just want, I just want something real. What's funny is like movies that are fantastical 
can still feel real because of the way they portray the fantastical. But then like this movie, yeah, even though it's the, probably the most like textbook in terms of this is what happened, here is a script, watch watch these actors perform actual events. It just doesn't feel genuine a lot. And I just I just I want something real. I want to I want something real. That's what I want. And that's probably why a lot of Christian fan Christians who like movies like Terrence Malick is because a lot of his stuff, even though he gets fantastical and weird, his stuff feels like real people and real stories and stuff. So I don't know. It's, it's, it's a fine movie. I can only imagine Daniel's getting that tattooed on his forehead, <laughs> as you guys know, but it's, it's just, it is what it is. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, it's weird because like the scale of genre, like I'm saying like inspirational movies, that tell touching true stories. This is kind of up there just because it's a good story and it's very real. Like up until the, the climax of the film, it is, it right. is 100% true. And obviously, you know, it gets brownie points with me for the core of the story being very Christian and the message of the movie being something I really appreciate and think is valid. Cause like, you don't get a ton of Christian films where it's not just a, about you know someone overcoming an obstacle through the power of God. He reconciles with his legitimately abusive father, and that's a right. beautiful story. That's a big deal. And that's a yeah. beautiful message. So on the scale of inspirational films, this film's pretty good. Like, you know, it, this is – I'm sure like when I worked at Christian Book, it, we sold a lot of copies of this film and like it's, it's, it's in my church's library. It's just – it's a, you know, and – it's so much better than so much of the other direct that we sold as far as just general Hallmark geek type movies. So there's, there's a little more here than a lot of other films, not just Christian films, again, like just the general kind of inoffensive light entertainment genre where there is some struggle, but it's overcome through the power of love or whatever. This film has more going on there than, mm-hmm. than those types of films. Mm-hmm. And it's, in terms of things wrong with the movie, there's not a lot wrong with it. Like there's not a lot of things yeah. that are bad in it. And so yeah. it's solidly put together. The, 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 the brother uh, directing duo that made the movie clearly have chops. Like they clearly, mm-hmm. there's some really nice looking shots in the movie. There's some great uh, sequences in it throughout. I think, yeah, it's just like refining it. Sets look lived in. The sets are like the sets look, it looks like everything was shot more or less on location. Yeah, and maybe we're just so used to like big CGI movies now that anything that looks like it's shot on an actual farm just <laughs> looks amazing now. I don't know. Yeah, but there's yeah, there's from a technical standpoint, there's nothing really wrong with the movie. All the acting is good. The guy who plays the main character, who we haven't really talked about much, he is not a seasoned actor. He is a theater actor who did all of his own singing in the film, which I always appreciate. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, and he sounds like a lot like the Mercy Me guy. <laughs> so there's that. Same with the gr- woman who plays his uh, girlfriend throughout the film. She's not a well-known actor. I think she's also a theater actor. So he's good in it. Like, he's never... He doesn't have to do anything big. Dennis Quaid gets to chew all the scenery and be big. But he just seems like a... No- he really comes off as a normal, likable guy. And that's not always easy to do. So he just seems like... He seems like the guy he's playing, which is really nice. So... I give this one a stronger recommendation than it feels like you were, you were giving. It's, you know, you're going to forget about this movie <laughs> shortly after seeing it. Just just like A Beautiful Mind. It's I <laughs> like A Beautiful Mind. I don't understand why you suddenly decided this is the episode we're going to hate A Beautiful Mind. It's it's baby's first gotcha. I, it, I, yeah, I give this one a light recommendation as if you're looking for a movie night with your grandparents, your uncles, and your cousins who none of them can watch movies with uh, rated R and you know, if it's that kind of movie night or your church is having a movie night and you're you're out of Pixar movies to show, you can show. I can only imagine it's much better than The Chosen. So many other Christian films I've seen. <laughs> so well, it's like, probably even, safer like, than The Chosen. Well, like yeah, Chosen we had issues because of theological things, but purely content wise, like I can only imagine first off, it's it's a decent movie time. It's an hour and fifty with credits, it's like an hour and forty, hour forty five. It's not like two and a half hours like so many movies these days. Every day I sound older on the show. It's not exhausting like American Gospel. That's an exhausting movie. Yeah. And that's just the first movie. And it's 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 not it's not trying to sell you anything. Like that's what really I think why I did so well with critics is there isn't like a multi every time the gospel's brought up, it feels genuine. It's it part makes of the story. Sense. Yeah, in the context of the story. Yeah, where he's like right. he's introducing his gospel message portion of his concert. Like that's one of the best music scenes where you see that like initially they were trying to be a more general rock band, 
but the part that sounds real and genuine to him is when he's talking about God and when they're doing worship music. And that's why they go in the musical direction they go to. That to me is so great because there's so many Christian bands where it feels like they just felt like they had to do something Jesus-y when they're set, you know, or because they're a Christian band, they had to play certain type of music. Here they establish this is just who they are. And so right. the art they make naturally is this. That to me is good. And so like compared to so many of the Christian films where like, God's not dead, where it feels like the movie is just a propaganda film for Jesus. This is a real story about a real guy and God and the gospel and church and worship music. Those are all things that are just in Exist. the DNA of his story. So they right. have to be there. And that's to me so much more powerful. Like the most powerful story of what you can give people is your testimony. It is how God has changed your life. And those are the types of stories I wish more Christian films would tell. And I think these guys get it because there's been a pivot in their films where now they're mostly making movies like this as opposed to like Mom's Night Out or whatever, you know, more movies subject wise like this versus something like, gosh, like, I don't know, but it's like, do you believe or or whatever, you know, all these like weird movies that are like trying to be polemics in the form of a movie, you know. So what kind of recommendations you got, Dan? There's two different. There's two two major. If you want to get into major theological camps, uh, the different the people's views of Acts. Uh, some view the gifts of the Spirit as for today. Others view them as not for today. And to give sort of a good balance of those, I recommend John MacArthur's two volume commentary on Acts. John MacArthur does not believe the gifts are for today, and that is fully illustrated as commentary on Acts. However, on the flip side, Stanley Horton is a well regarded theologian among uh, more Pentecostal charismatic circles. He, he also wrote a systematic theology that's really interesting, but he also has a commentary in the book of Acts where he takes a position that the gifts are for today. And I think those two commentaries together give sort of a good overview of both sides of the, of the argument. And they together, I think, form a good view where you can kind of like figure out what you believe for yourself. There's a ton of great Acts commentaries out there. Like, you know, R.C. Sproul's commentary on Acts is very good. I like John Stott's commentary on Acts, but I think those two are two of my favorites. They're the ones I grab off my shelf the most when reading an Acts or doing any sort of teaching in Acts. So I recommend those for my commentary. For me, I'm going to recommend a game that I believe is still on Game Pass. If anyone has the $15 a month uh, Xbox, basically Netflix for game service. It's a game called Donut County. It's basically the, the premise of the gameplay is you view basically a, it's a very cartoony kind of, boxy looking world and you're a, a hole and all you do is move under things and eat them and as you do that your hole gets bigger and there's puzzles to it it's but it's mostly just cute and fun but the the running story basically opens up with a, a series of characters who have a campfire deep underground and are like this is all your fault mr raccoon why are we all stuck here and then the raccoon it's because there's a bunch of uh, animals. It's really cute. Um, the raccoon basically talks about how, like, what do you mean? It's not my fault. And then the friend's like, yes, it is. Because ever since you guys moved in, there have been holes showing up in our community and county. As the story unravels and as you, the whole, eat more and more things that exist, such as people's homes, trailers, and cute little animals, the story unfolds to be basically a very cute little commentary on sort of how not anti-capitalist, as everyone knows that I enjoy talking about, but it um, it kind of gets into basically these raccoons moved into the town and started buying up properties and filling out companies and um, gentrifying the area. And the example given throughout the gameplay and metaphor is that it's like this hole that eats everything up. So you find out all the other friends, the animal friends in the in this pit are basically people who owned properties that have been just decimated by this uh these raccoons these trash pandas and the reason they do that is because the trash pandas were tired of eating trash so they decided to become monopolists um it's a very fun cute game very quick on game pass totally free donut county check it out what's your fun reco dan um i'm going to recommend uh read this the book the starless sea it's great. I think I've seen people read that on my Goodreads. What's it about? I'm not going to tell you. Okay. Is it literally like best to go in blind, that kind of thing? Yes. Who's the author? Um, Morgan Stern. What's her last name? She wrote uh, The Night Circus, which is also a well-regarded book. And I'm seeing on Goodreads too. Yes. What What's her shtick? What does she like to write about? Just to give people something. The nature of stories. 
in storytelling. So very, are her books very metatextual then? This one is. I have not read The Night Circus. Uh, my wife really loves The Night Circus. Morgan Stern, the one, the one caution I'll give is some people find her writing to be too, not tangential, but it's very like, she has a very meandering style and purpose that for me really, really pays off, especially in The Starless Sea, which my friend, uh, who is both a book person and a very devout Catholic, described she said reading this book was like for her like almost like a religious experience. Uh, so for for some types of people, a starless sea is going to pay off immensely. It's for me, it's the exact type of book I like. I I thought it was beautiful and I thought it was thoughtful and it's interesting and yeah, I highly recommend it. Nice. Thanks so much for checking out this episode of Cinematic Doctrine. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving a review and subscribing to the podcast. And as mentioned before, Cinematic Doctrine has a Patreon. For as little as $3 a month, you're opted into a once-a-month movie poll where you decide a movie we discuss on the podcast. There are other unique benefits that come with supporting the podcast, so be sure to check that out at patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine. A special shout out to those who support at the Art House Theater tier on Patreon. Thank you so much, Mom, Dad, Melanie, Sherlyon, and Thomas. You guys are the best, and your continued monetary support is greatly appreciated. Until next time, stay cool. Want some Cinematic Doctrine swag? You're in luck. We've got 3-inch Cinematic Doctrine logo stickers exclusive for Patreon supporters. Perfect for your travel mug or laptop. Head over to patreon.com forward slash cinematic doctrine, link in the show notes, and choose the independent theater tier. Doing so will net you other perks too. But let's be real, the podcast stickers are the coolest perk. So get yourself some podcast stickers by supporting on Patreon.